portable device, I kind of like this because it's portable and you can pick it up and you can probably <coughs> get away with you know, getting the test done faster and not paying the technician as much money. Um, but test pits are generally dug on a site and either this device or that device or similar devices are used. A lot of times the, the, for particular cities or counties, they, sometimes they actually tell you what test to use, an ASTM test typically. Okay, um, the, there are various ways to characterize the strength of soil. I'm not going to, this is not a uh, soils testing lecture, but this is, these are the, basically the different ways it's done. Uh, around here, California bearing ratio is used. Um, it's very common to use that method, that test method. It basically assesses the strength of the soil when it's saturated, its compressibility, how much bearing capacity does it have compared to a dense graded compacted road base. So these are the materials we're dealing with. Um, in our literature, in our design literature, for the ICPI literature, we give we assign values to these, very conservative strength values to those. So, uh, and then minimizing compaction is usually an objective, sometimes it's not. Particularly when you're working in green alley, sometimes it doesn't matter. You know, you're working in horrible urban soils anyway, so. Uh, but in, in greenfield, uh, can be very important, greenfield, new construction. Um, and then keeping the aggregates clean, you don't want them to get full of sediment. It's a very, the, the whole operation is quite pristine as far as moving the, the aggregates around, keeping them clean. Now, I just want to walk you through con some construction projects. This is a driveway, how driveways can be done. This is one with clay soil, so it has drain pipes. <coughs> and what's interesting here, the edge is compacted, dense graded base, good old fashioned road base that is not real permeable. It's actually almost impermeable. At least wa if water moves through it, it goes pretty slow. And then in the middle here is the open graded base. And here's what the cross section looks like. Pavers, bedding, base, sub-base, drain pipe on the outside if you want to handle overflows, which is usually a good idea. I'm not a big fan of the water coming up out of the surface and overflowing when Hurricane Katrina shows up. I'm more of a fan of let's put it somewhere um, and so it doesn't move all the pollutants out that collect in the joints. So, whoops, there we go. So the base is put in, it's compacted. <coughs> this particular job doesn't use the sub-base. Can, can you go back three slides? Three slides. First one shown up there. Yeah, here. Yeah, so there's no, no geotechnical being used there, right? No. The question comes up a lot, do we use geotextile? Uh, the official industry position is whatever. The reason why we say whatever is we've seen jobs go in with geotextile and work fine, and we've seen them go in without and they work fine. And I think the reason is, is that they've worked fine without it, is the bases are generally fairly thick, the stones are large, that the number two stone or three stone is fairly large and stable when it's compacted. Uh, some engineers like to put it in, or, or landscape architects like to put it in when it's, when it's um, um, clay soils. So, anyway, and also this is a driveway. The amount of this is most this is car traffic and not very much. This is a very very lightly loaded pavement, so it's not going to require, you know, geotextile. There's some geotextile shown here on this detail. You can do that if you want. Compaction, um, checking grades, which is always a good idea. Uh, doing a little bit of touch up on the side here to make sure the base is aligned, the edges are aligned, and then here he's starting the. Um, layout of the pavers. <coughs> now what's happened here is on top of the base is the, that thin layer, about two inch layer of number eight zone, that three inch chip, is screeded out very smoothly. <coughs> um, and then the paver pattern is started. You always st strike what's called a, a perpendicular when you lay out pavers. And then uh, a little bit of spacing adjustment, then compacting the pavers, filling the joints, Compacting them. Actually, you don't have to compact the pavers the first time. You just fill the joints and compact them in most cases. And then that's what it looks like when it's done for this particular. Okay, so that's a residential. Let's let's move to commercial real quick to show you some commercial work. Um, this is uh, one project. Again, no geotextile. Soils weren't bad. You can tell even from the color that it probably has some permeability. It's not you know reddish brown. It's sort of this almost orangey color. Um, so number two sub-base, just notice the equipment's being used. Basically road construction equipment. 
number two is compacted, number 57 is compacted on top. This is switching to another job just to show an example of how the stone is screeded. This is done with <coughs> these bars, these are aluminum bars, they're set on the base, the compacted base. And understand that the contractor is constantly adjusting that, the, the base while he's compacting to make it smooth and make it to uh, specified grades. These bars are put across, this is called a screed bucket. Stone is dumped and it just this little bobcat here just pulls this bucket across and smooths it. There's actually machines that do it automatically. They're like miniature asphalt spreaders. Anyway, the permeable pavers are put in on top of the bedding. This is the Portland project. Uh, and the joints are filled and then they're compacted. Notice that when the pavers on this job, this is the Portland job I showed you a little while ago, the pavers are about an inch above and so they're compacted level with the existing uh, impermeable pavement. This is a project in um, British Columbia. This is a uh, classic strip mall, okay? Lots of stores. Uh, all of the runoff from the roofs go into the permeable pavement, not to mention all the rain that falls on it. There are no catch basins in this project, none. All the water collects and goes to here. There's a couple of oil separators to clean up, the, do some polishing or finishing on the water, and then it goes out into the storm sewer system. Up to what design storm is that? This? Yeah. Uh, not a lot because this is British Columbia. I don't know what the design criteria is, but in the as you know, in the Northwest, there's basically two seasons: the wet season in July. Yeah. And the wet season, the the, the, the wet season, it essentially drizzle, drizzles. So this this technology is perfect. Particularly, this is on a fill soil, so there's no infil there's no infiltration. This is an engineered fill that was done. Put down the geotextile, probably a good idea with fill soil. Open graded aggregates, base, sub base put in base. Again, highway type trucks putting it in. Mechanical installation. Again, the machine picks up about 40 pavers in the prescribed lane pattern, puts it on the screeded stone, and uses it to uh, basically put a layer in about every 20 seconds. So one machine, I mean, generally, it depends on the crew, but generally, Five to 10,000 square feet a day per crew, which isn't bad. Um, what's interesting is the contract, the, the GC on this job, the general contractor, really, really liked the pavers because he can put all his building materials on it while he's building the shopping center. So I'm not sure if this is going to, here we go. This shows you how it works. Again, the machine comes in, picks up the layer, the layer of pavers. They're in prescribed laying pattern. You know, a good machine operator at a well-organized site, you can put a layer down about every 15 or 20 seconds, something like that. And then a guy, a guy comes by with a little rubber hammer there, just kind of straightens things up, kind of tight, tidies up, makes sure all the joints are, you know, fairly consistent among all the pavers. Because <clears throat> you, if, if you think about this, you have to understand that, well, yeah, each layer has got to be pretty much the same dimension, you know, because he's putting a jigsaw puzzle together, if you will. So that's how pretty much how it works. This particular project is about a 500 car parking lot uh, outside Chicago called Morton Arboretum, which if you're landscape people, if you love trees, go to Morton Arboretum. It's, it's unbelievable. And they have permeable pavement. They put the permeable pavement in to protect a lake. That's why they installed it. Again, getting back <coughs> to the British Columbia job, the joints are filled and they're compacted. Now let's talk about maintenance. The number one question I get when I do presentations from municipalities is, well, does it cost any more to take care of this? Um, the word I'm getting back is kind of a qualified no, not really. You know, we, we, yeah, we do have to clean it. We have to sweep up the sediment and junk, but you know, we, we plow it like any other pavement. We can salt it if we have to. Um, we go easy on the sand in the winter. Some, some places sand it and they don't vacuum it. But I'll get into that in a moment. But essentially what we're finding out is there's two machines out there, two types of machines. This one up here is called a regenerative air machine and it's good for doing um, regular routine maintenance, doing three or four times a year. This machine, I don't know if you can see it from the back, but this, there's a big box underneath and there's two big hoses and there's a uh, giant fan inside and recirculates the air very quickly. What happens inside this box is the air moves so quickly there's a venturi effect and so there's suction and so it pulls up anything loose that's on the pavement. So this is good for getting off leaves and twigs and 
cigarettes and whatever's you know loose on the pavement. Very good for for regular maintenance. This machine right here is about twice as powerful. This is called a true vacuum machine. True vacuum because it actually sucks. Um, there's a, an orifice, kind of an intake, like a giant nozzle, about yay big on the bottom. You don't want to get your hand too close to it because you may not see your hand again. This machine actually can pull the pavers out. If you set the RPM up high enough on this machine, you can actually suck the pavers out. So what you have to do with this, this, this guy here in the driver's seat, you have to tell him, you know, start out on your low, and it can actually, this machine can actually pull the joints, stones out to a prescribed depth, typically about an inch, and those stones usually have sediment in them, and then the stones are replaced after they're pulled out from the dirty stones. Winter maintenance, again, can be plowed. Uh, what we're finding on permeable pavements is this kind of thing, where the snow is removed. It's plowed, as any other pavement, and there's always little bits of snow left over that sometimes refreeze on impervious pavement, but that doesn't happen, or it's very, very rare that it happens on permeable pavement because the sun comes out, warms up the pavement, warms up those little patches, and they melt and they go into the pavement. So we're seeing that happen on a lot of projects, even as far north as New Hampshire and Minnesota, we're seeing that happen in the wintertime in Toronto. So a big plus, um, reduces liability, reduces slipping, and so forth, of those found things. Here's what happens if you don't vacuum with the sand builds up, you need to clean that out. And the snow, the dirty snow, has to be not placed on the permeable pavement. Uh, just to kind of wrap up here, um, the American Society of Civil Engineers, um, I've been active in ASCE for a long time. Um, they, um, they're organized, the, the ASCE is, if you're not, in engineers, if you're not, organized, if you're not involved in ASCE, get involved, it's a real interesting group. I've been working on a committee that's getting ready to put out this, this manual right here. It's on permeable pavements, and it's, it's, it covers all the permeable pavements, and there's a chapter on each. Um, and it's basically the, uh, going to be the next guidebook, national guidebook, on permeable pavement design and construction and maintenance. And there'll be guide specs in here for PICP as well as the other systems. So um, this, will, this will be out in the winter time. <coughs> Excuse me, it'll be online only. It will not be printed. Um, the only reason why I have a print copy is I'm one of the editors. So I get to you know, play with the words. So this, this will be a very, very good resource from ASCE. Um, also, our institute, Interlocking Concrete Pavement Institute, we publish a manual that looks like this. You can buy it online, I think it's like 18 bucks. Um, it's about 100 pages. <coughs> There's a copy down here if you'd like to take a look at it. Um, what's nice about this book is it it's essentially soup to nuts. Everything you need to know about permeable interlocking concrete pavement. It's got guide specs, it's got maintenance checklists, has maintenance agreements if a municipality wants to an agreement with a private property owner to maintain their permeable pavement, that sort of thing. And it promotes the use of uh, certified uh, contractors that have gone through an ICPI certificate course on permeable interlocking concrete pavements. This is what the manual looks like, the course manual here. And what we're seeing is that uh, the certificates, basically workers with certificates, contractors or subcontractors with certificates actually being required to be on the job to put in permeable and locking concrete pavements. So that's uh, where that is. I mentioned uh, earlier our software. We have permeable design pro software. Very cool piece of software. <coughs> uh, what it allows you to do is that balancing act that I described earlier, where you can actually play with in clay soils, those clay soils where, that don't take in a whole lot of water, you can put pipes, you can put drain pipes in, and you can elevate them. This is the cool part, is that when you raise the pipes or raise the outlets, you allow some water to collect and drain in a certain amount of time, drain into the soil a certain amount of time. So what you can do is you can kind of, with the software, is you can move the pipes up and down and watch how much water drains in, you can also vary their spacing, their number, and play with how much water is going to be leaving that pavement. 
based on the number of pipes and their spacing. So you can play with this dimension on the pipes and the number of pipes this way. So very, very powerful piece of software, especially when you're in clay soils. From a design perspective, designing permeable pavements in sandy soils is easy. There's almost no risk. Almost all the water is going to go in. When you're in clay soils, you know that some of the water is not. This software helps do that. Um, very, very uh, cool piece of software. Um, I actually do classes on how to use this. Um, whoops, what happened here? Let's push the wrong button. There we go. Mm, the battery's about dead. That's the problem. I just happen to have another battery. Um, the, um, the manual that I mentioned uh, looks like this. And you're welcome to come down and take a look at it. The, um, this is why I always carry a spare battery or two. Because you never know what it's going to die. Yeah, how about some questions while I change the batteries? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, there's, there's really two ways to look at that. One is the surface. How long does the surface last? Which is probably 40 to 50 years. And then how long does the pavement system last? Um, you know, the actual structure? Frankly, we don't know. We designed for somewhere between 20 and 30 years. It's really, the reason why we don't know is because we, every design is different. Really, from a stormwater perspective, what's controlling the ability of that system to work is how much sediment it's receiving and how well it processes it. And we don't, as an, as an industry, and the science is really kind of new, frankly, the understanding of how these systems work long term is still being, still unknown. <coughs> one thing we have discovered, or one thing we do know, this working. Can you advance the thing yeah. manually? Yeah, I only got a couple more slides. The um, one thing we do know is there you go. The um, one thing one thing we do know is the um, um, this system is not like a detention pond. While it kind of works like one in, in, with regard to processing pollutants, breaking down oils, um, adsorbing metals, processing phosphorus and, and nitrogen, um, it's not as concentrated. A detention, imagine a detention pond. I'm sure there's plenty on the campus. There's plenty everywhere. You can, they kind of like grow. They pop up anywhere there's a development. Detention ponds, the idea is to focus, concentrate all the water from an impervious pavement into this small area and hopefully get some processing, maybe some infiltration, and then drain it out slowly, control the flow, control the volume, maybe reduce the volume. With permeable pavements, it's more distributive. We're sp actually spreading the water out. Yes, there may be some water running in from roofs. There may be some water running in from adjacent impermeable uh, road or parking. That's OK. But still, the water is, is, and the pollutants are being distributed. So there is a much, I think, much lower risk of a system clogging, a much lower risk of a system actually stopping to, uh, to process the pollutants. So it's a great question. Um, and uh, uh, kind of the, the simple answer is time will tell. But most detention ponds are designed for a 20-year life. We can certainly design these for a 20-year life in terms of processing because they're not handling, on a square foot or square yard basis, they're not handling anywhere near the concentration of pollutants that a detention pond would advance it. So, so just a um, couple more slides. Um, please visit our website, icpi.org. When you, on the home page, click on this. This is where all the good stuff is on design tools. and you. Get a bunch of links that look like this. Tech specs, these are bulletins on various aspects of interlocking pavements and permeable. Uh, there's guide specs, there's detailed drawings. We have something like 80 drawings, 80 some drawings. There's probably about, I don't know, maybe 12 or, or 15 that deal with permeable pavements. 
There's case studies, articles. We actually have a, a database of technical papers, too, and there's a lot of permeable data in there as well. So please visit that. There's a lot of good resources. Next, please. And this is the last one. Can you, can you click the, there you go. Okay, this is kind of the, the final slide. This is a fire department in Louisville. This is what you give fire department guys to do on a rainy day. You just say, I mean, you could, if you make a generous contribution, they certainly will show up, but they show up anyway. And they come and put water on your new permeable pavement. Now, what's, what I find interesting is I've been to these kinds of let's dump the water on the permeable pavement and show everybody how quickly it goes into demonstrations. Um, and I have looked at videos from other projects as well, like this one. And um, what I find most interesting is human behavior. The people watching this happening are gawking at the fact that the water goes into the pavement. They're just going, oh, oh, it goes into the pavement. You know, and what that tells me is this system about transforming infrastructure is changing expectations. That's what it's about. It's changing the expectation of what we would like the infrastructure to do, specifically the drainage infrastructure. And instead of running it off, putting into the ground, and more than just reducing stormwater runoff, actually transforming infrastructure with uh, water reuse, with traffic calming, with the economic development, with the education, all the things that I, that I mentioned, uh, basically opening up and using that multiplier effect. And really that's what they, the, where the transformation is. Uh, certainly in expectations, but then in all those things that I mentioned in our society. So any, any more questions? Yes. Roughly. There's some L shape, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought of making them larger and maybe making holes through them so that you're doing more vert fewer verts and larger surfaces? Yeah, but there's there's this thing called concrete. C concrete um, abhors penetrations, holes. Um, it'll crack. The reason why the units are small is um, because of interlock. The units actually, when they're compacted, they interlock, meaning they take vertical forces and through shear mechanism in the stones and the joints, spread them horizontally like other pavements do. So um, the reason why the units are not bigger is because um, you would have to, you, as you get bigger, you get thicker, and it gets unwieldy. It gets very, very complicated from a construction perspective. Yeah? Related to that, do you know what the actual spec of the concrete is if the Nicholas breaks out? How many PSI? Yeah, the PSI is, is 8,000 PSI. It's very strong. It's the, what's, what I really like about um, pavers, about concrete pavers, is that they're manufactured in a factory. And I don't know if you've ever worked a construction site where concrete is poured. I have. The sobriety of the ready mix truck drivers on Monday morning is always in question. <laughs> and that may or may not have an effect on the quality of con concrete that comes out of the chute. That's debatable. That, that's variable, rather. But with the pavers, they're made in a factory. They're consistent. There's an ASTM standard, it's called C936, that says that average strength should be 8,000 PSI. So you're, you're working with a very strong, dense piece of, of concrete. Thank you. Question, yeah. What is the maximum slope? Slope, good, good question. Um, the, the, yeah, the question was what's the maximum slope? Um, I have seen projects up to 12%, and I have heard they're higher. But general, I'm talking about the, the surface slope. Um, when you do surface slopes over, say, 3%, you're, you're probably going to have to design in some kind of berm system to slow the water down. There's a couple of different ways to pull off berms. You can dig trenches, you can use soil, you can put in, uh, in the case of Richmond, they put in actual pieces of concrete, they just pour some concrete, little dams, little check dams. Um, but the volume of water that each little dam 
stops and then usually comes through a little orifice or a little opening in the dam to the next one. That all has to be calculated. The idea is to slow the water down, allow some of it to infiltrate, and then move to the next dam and the next and the next. That's generally how slopes are handled. Most installations I've seen are flat or nearly flat. Yeah? Does the website have any of those designs in those 80 drawings that you talked about that we, do with steep slopes? We do have, in the manual, we have a steep slope, okay. some details. I think they're on the website, too. Yeah? How the system hold up to snow plows? No removal. Um, fine. Fine. Um, what's interesting is I was in Iowa two weeks ago taking pictures of the Charles City and the West Union projects and the Dubuque projects, and I was talking to the, the street superintendent for Charles City. That's the one with the, the, with all the 27 blocks, a residential area, all redone. Um, he said they started out using uh, plastic you know, edges, and they got to the point where they said this is a waste of time, and they just decided to use steel. So they just they went back to their steel blades. They, you know, they were kind of, you know, a little sensitive. They might, you know, hurt the pavers, but the pavers are really hard to hurt. So you you can plow them. I showed you the Warrenville Drive, that long street uh, with that big, big black plastic pipe. That one's just plowed straight up, like any other with steel. Yeah. Uh, two common questions. Mm -hmm. One is I, I don't think we saw anything with the uh, plastic edging that's commonly used. Um, the issues, what happens at the edge is mm -hmm. often, uh, you know, fillets and things like that. Right. Like tires pushing out. And right. You get, right. get some areas that don't always hold up. Yeah, plastic edging, um, I wouldn't use it. There's, I wouldn't use it at all. If, you, if you're going to do residential, there are some systems that are kind of clever where GeoGrid is fastened into either a plastic or aluminum edge. <clears throat> and that is put underneath the paver. That is strictly, strictly, underlying capital letters, pedestrian. Would not drive on that. So you would do hard curbs generally? You generally do hard curbs, yeah. Or I showed you the, for the driveways, I showed you the compacted base. Yeah. Now that, you can use the plastic edging that's nailed in. That's the, that's the whole reason to do those berms on either side of dense graded compacted material, you know, just good old fashioned road base, is so that those plastic edgings can be nailed, say, every foot with those metal stike, stakes, that, spikes. That compacted edge was made out of uh, crusher run? Yeah. 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 Whatever, what is it here, CR6? CR6. Yeah, yeah, Virginia, it's 21A. Yeah, yeah. I know you're saying the water gets out of the system rather quickly. Mm. What if you ever had like a perfect storm situation where? That profile is filling up with water, freezing temperatures yeah. fill up. Okay, that, okay, the question is what happens if it fills up and then freezes? It won't happen. It won't happen. It, it, it can never get that. It might in the South Pole, but it doesn't rain in the South Pole. Um, yeah, it won't happen. The, what's interesting is that all permeable pavements take longer to freeze in the winter. And the question comes up, well, what about expanding water? And don't we get heaving and all this? And the answer is there's been, there's been at least three studies I know, I know of that have demonstrated that it doesn't happen. Four, four I can think of the fourth one. Um, that it doesn't happen. And the reason why it doesn't happen is all the water drains out, number one. Number two, there's some, because you're down two or three feet, there's some heat from that soil, not a lot, but there's some heat from that soil to delay the freezing of the cross section. And then if there's any probability of water actually getting stuck in that base, the void space in that base is like 35 40%. So there's plenty of space for the water to freeze, OK? So you're not going to see movement. Yeah? Um, looking at those um, photos you showed, mm -hmm. it appears that all the roads are flat. There's no crown. So there's no need for a crown on the road. They can, they can, all, they can all be flat. Yeah, they can be flat or maybe just tilt to one side. You know, yeah, a little bit, half percent. Yeah, question. If you were to do this in a, a large parking lot and you wanted to have tree islands, mm -hmm. uh, it's a really dry environment. How would you do something like that? The trees love it. Absolutely love it. Well, how would you do it if you did islands? Yeah. Um, what I would do is is take the base up to the island, and where the you could do it, you could do it a couple ways. You can use those what are those thing called those root separators, deep root. They have a name. 
cells? Yeah, not silver. Well, you could use silver cells. I mean, silver, silver cells and Filterra, those are all designed to accommodate permeable pavement because they have hard concrete edges. But if you're just talking about an island with soil, what you want to do is you want to have a piece of geotextile separating the open graded base and sub base from that soil. Trees love permeable pavement. They just, and what's really neat about trees, they don't heave permeable pavement because they're going for the water. Going, the roots are going down, they're not going up because the water's not up, the water's down. Unlike, you know, the classic concrete sidewalk where the roots kind of come up and, you know, try to get drink some of the water under there. Yeah. Um, this has been used long enough now that there must be failures. And so, is mm -hmm. that true? And what lessons learned, what insights have you got from failures? Yeah. Um, number one, vacuum. All permeable pavements clog. I don't care what system you're talking about. They all clog. They all take in sediment. The rate at which they take in depends on the site. Um, because it is a you know, stormwater management practice, you've got to maintain it. You've got to clean it. Um, I have seen very few structural. I've only seen one structural problem um, where the lows were channelized in one area. Um, and that was, I think that was resolved by either putting in, in uh, geogrid or geotextile, I can't remember which. Um, the reason why I have not seen structural failures is because the bases are over-designed. So they're super thick <laughs> from a, a structural perspective. For the hydrology, no, they're, they work for the hydrology, yeah. Yeah, question? Um, it's kind of a two-parter. Um, mm -hmm. I guess with the green alleyways that have been going in, mm -hmm. I know there's evidence it's already, but my concern would be being so close to buildings that obviously have basement structures or 